Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, bienvenue and welcome on behalf of BMJ Group and IHI to the 17th International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare. So we're 17 years old. Wow. And as you can see, we've just passed our driving test. And what better way to celebrate than to arrive here in the company car? The reasons for its appearance on the stage will become apparent as the day progresses. The past few years have seen difficult financial challenges for healthcare systems in all parts of the world. This year's theme, Solutions for Tough Times, aims to help you practically address these issues. And this year, amazingly, given those tough economic times, this is our biggest Congress forum ever, with over 2,700 delegates attending from 76 countries. And that is really an amazing achievement. So let's give ourselves a big round of applause. Don Berwick just told me um, earlier this morning that the first Congress, 17 years ago, uh, we had 300 delegates in London. So that's really a wonderful growth in the community of people working towards improved quality and safety in healthcare. Many more than the 2,700 here in Paris are tuning into our live broadcast and remote participation sites in Japan, New Zealand, Russia, and Oman. So again, let's welcome our colleagues joining us via our live broadcast. A big thank you to our sponsors. KPMG are our headline sponsors this year. Uh, we also have uh, support from the Health Foundation, who sponsored our scientific symposium yesterday, from DNV Healthcare, the, le the sector lead from Bupa, Hewlett Packard, and Robert Bosch Healthcare. Very many thanks to you all. Thank you to our local hosts, La Haute Autorité de Santé and the Agence Nationale d'Appui à la Performance des Establissements de Santé et Médicaux Sociaux. We're really delighted to be here in Paris. Thank you, um, an enormous thank you to the Forum Strategic Advisory Board. Um, now, I know they would like to, um, to um, speak to you and meet you during the conference. I'm going to ask them to stand up. Um, and in the spirit of continuous quality improvement, are they standing up? I can't see. There they are. Look, aren't they marvellous? And look, there are their photographs. In the spirit of continuous quality improvement, they want to hear from you during the forum what you like, what you don't like, um, and they're going to take those comments on board. Uh, they're already planning next year's Congress, next year's forum in London. Thank you to our exhibitors. Please be sure to visit them in the exhibition hall uh, throughout the, the week. We've had a record number of posters this year, so 2,000 abstracts submitted, 2,400 abstracts submitted, of whom 700 were successful, and those are the posters on display on level two. Uh, now, in case the posters themselves aren't sufficient incentive, there are drinks and canapes at the poster reception after the last keynote today. So please do go and look at the posters. And if you have a poster, um, please stand by it, um, ready to receive constructive criticism, <laughs> encouragement as well. Talking of encouragement, we are delighted this year to have again um, over 100 students on our dedicated track for students and tutors led by the IHI Open School team. And I wonder if um, they wouldn't mind standing up now because they are the people we really want to encourage. They are the next generation of quality improvement professionals. So if, could the students all please stand up and give us a wave? Being modest, they'll probably be at the back. Oh, there's one at the front. Marvellous. Congratulations to you all for being here. They had to submit um, a proposal and abstract in order to win a place at the forum. So they are, they are um, our future leaders. Finally, before I introduce our first key keynote speaker, we're excited to announce that we have a new smartphone app, or, or several apps, in fact. Uh, so you can now use your iPad, iPhone, smartphone, or laptop um, to access useful information about the forum this year. So the information includes the entire program, 
which you can personalise to your schedule, handouts of each session, hoping to show that on the slide in a minute, um, and a map, importantly for those of you who get lost, as I have done several times today, a map of the venue. And this is very exciting because it actually has GPS enabled, so you can actually um, <laughs> follow yourself around and, and, and maybe become your very own green shirt if you, if you show yourself around. There you go. You can be on that, on that uh, GPS. Um, you can also view the posters which look fantastic on this iPad. So um, please do download the app, which you can do from the web link, which I think will be shown on the screen in a minute, or just via the App Store. So we are entering the uh, uh, 21st century in a big way with these apps. Now, to introduce our first keynote of the forum. She's the President and Chief Executive of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Prior to succeeding Don Berwick in 2010, she served as IHI's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for 15 years. She is a prominent authority on improving healthcare systems, whose expertise has been recognised by her elected membership of the Institute of Medicine and by her appointment to the Commonwealth Fund's Commission on a High Performance Health System. She advises healthcare leaders from around the world and is a tireless advocate for change and improvement it's my great pleasure to introduce Maureen Bisignano. Bienvenue and bonjour. I'm delighted to be with you all here in Paris for our 17th meeting. And I've never really shared a stage with the car before, but uh, that's today. Uh, first, I want to thank our... our uh, sponsors, our co-presenters and our partners at the BMJ, and also the incredible team at IHI and our board, uh, many of whom are here today. Every year, for about almost a week, for the past several years, I've spent time in Columbia, South Carolina. It's a city in the southern part of the United States with an unusually high burden of illness. For example, in one Postal code 29203. There are about 40,000 people, 83% of them are African American. Almost uh, many of them have no health insurance, and there's an incredible burden of obesity, uh, ca cardiac disease, and diabetes among this population. Now, last year, when I was there, we were talking among the group uh, assembled. There were healthcare leaders, uh, executives, physicians, nurses, public health officials, and students. And as we sat around the room, we were thinking, how could we improve the health of the population here in Postal Code 29203? And we were brainstorming things like, could we get more medication to patients? Would it be possible to put some health clinics out in the community, perhaps in pharmacies or in, in local department stores? Could we get hospital outpatient clinics? How could we improve the health? The question we were asking ourselves is, could more health care produce better health? And the answer to that question came from a special and surprising place. A local artist named Tim Floyd presented with me with a painting at that meeting. And he said, this is the answer, he said, I think, to health care problems. And he said, he, he, he painted this painting for all of us. But he painted this painting because he said, health care right now is stuck in silos. And if you look at the bottom of the, the painting here, he depicts the current healthcare system in little squares and, the, and it's dark. And he said the bottom of the, the painting is a place that's really depressing in which to get care and it's really a depressing place to work. He said everybody's their own little silo. And he said when I go to one doctor, I'll get the results of my uh, hemoglobin. But then I have to go to another doctor to get my blood pressure medication. And then I'll see a nurse about some counseling or some education. But he said the silos are very dark. And he said it's really hard for a patient to navigate through the silos. And then he drew the line across the middle of the painting. And he said, Maureen, he said, this is the edge of change. 
And he said, this is the quality improvement movement in South Carolina. And he said, what you're doing is you're breaking open the silos. And he said, up at the top, what we're seeing is best practices being shared from one hospital to another. We're seeing physicians and nurses collaborate in multi-professional teams. And he said, as we see the edge of change, what we're seeing is care is continuous, and it's a much more joyous and sane place to work. So I was really surprised to see this. But this year, next week I'll be in South Carolina, and there's a, an entirely different team of people going to be there. The doctors and the nurses, the health care executives will be there. But there'll also be elderly folks from the community. There'll be ministers. There'll be uh, young families, young parents with children talking about what it's like to raise a child in that community nowadays. There'll be school teachers, and there'll be representatives from the environment. They've created a team that they've called the vision team, and they've said only when we get the entire community together, when we see the assets across the entire community, are we going to be able to solve this health care problem? More of the little medical care in the little boxes is not going to solve the health care problem. We've got to see the assets in the community, move up to share, and build a healthy community all together. So I'm excited to be there next week. I'm excited to see who will be in that room and how different the conversation will be next week as it has been for the past several years when we've made little bits of progress, but not nearly enough to kind of see the changes that we need to make. In the vision team, they've adopted the IHI triple aim. This is their new set of aims now. And they've said together, we have to work on the health of the population for all of South Carolina, particularly for Columbia, and particularly for Postal Code 29203. And they said, we've got to do that by changing the experience of care. We've got to make care accessible and easy, We've got to make care patient-centered. We've got to change the way we think about care. And in doing so, we've got to drive down the cost per capita. We can't afford to add more little silos because it's not producing the best care. So the challenge I have for you today is, first of all, to look back at the successes that we've all built. This is 17 years, going from 300 to 2,700 people, uh, going from a couple of nations to, to uh, almost 80 nations in this room. And there's lots of accomplishments that we should be celebrating. Safety accomplishments, access, um, looking at new models and new processes, looking, hearing the, beginning to hear the voice of the patient in the new designs, and even the beginnings of electronics. I was with George Halverson, the CEO from Kaiser Permanente, just a few weeks ago. And George pulled out his cell phone. And he said, uh, just like Fiona was introducing you to the app, he said, Maureen, this app is my medical record. And he said, I can now get my lab results just a few hours after the blood is drawn on my cell phone. He said, I can make an appointment with any doctor on my panel uh, on my cell phone. He said, I can text my doctor and get a response back very quickly. And he said, I can order my prescription refills on my cell phone. So we've made a lot of progress. But I want to push you this morning to think about where we really need to go next. And I'm going to say that we need to go forward in three different ways to think. The first is really new changes in the way that we interact at the patient level. The second is at the organization level. And then the third is at the community level. And I'll walk you through briefly each one of these levels this morning, give you some examples of where I think we can head, and give you some ideas about what you might do when you return to your organization, whether you take care of patients one-on-one, -on -one, whether you're working in an intensive care unit in an organization, or whether you have the great ability to see into the community and to bring those assets together. So let's start with patients. First of all, I think we need to move, as Susan Edgman Levitin would say, from what's the matter, healthcare, to what matters to you. I recently sat in my own physician's office for a half a day, and I listened to care, and she's a wonderful doctor, 
But the way our care is structured now, it's structured around what's the matter. I watched patients come in and the first question is, what's the matter or what brings you here today? It's my hemoglobin, it's my blood pressure, it's my annual checkup. I have an abnormal mammogram. But it's about what's the matter and then the visit turns to taking care of the symptoms about what's the matter. What I want you to think about today is how do we move from what's the matter to what matters to you? Because when we get that level of patient interaction, we're going to see an entirely new healthcare system and much better clinical outcomes at a lower cost. My friend Muir Gray would say, the patient isn't the problem. He said so often when he's working with clinicians, what he hears is that the patients are anxious or non-compliant or they're living unhealthy lifestyles and the healthcare system then has to bear the burden of those bad results. And what Muir is saying is, it's not the patient that's the problem. And we really need to think about new ways to partner with patients in order to use the assets that those patients are bringing to the encounter, to the health, the health of, their, uh, of their, the patients and their families. Victor Montori from Mayo Clinic uh, and I have been working together and thinking about it in this way. Victor describes the need for minimally disruptive medicine. And when I asked Victor the first time about this, he said, we really have to understand what's the burden of the disease. And what Victor has done is he's sat with patients for days, for months, and he's tracked what is it like? What's the burden of having diabetes? What's the burden of having congestive heart failure? And he's actually tracked the minutes in a day when the patient is not living life but taking care of their illness. That's the burden of the illness. And when you actually sit with patients, it's quite a burden. Many of you may be caring for parents or for people in your family. Many of you may be caring for your own diseases and you understand that it's not just living your life. There's a burden in time, in stress, every single day in managing the illness. So what Victor says is, Sometimes there's nothing we as healthcare professionals can do about the burden of the illness, but we surely can decrease the burden of the treatment. We can move away from what's the matter thinking to what matters to you thinking. And that would be a change in the way that you schedule patients, a change in the way that you get your lab results. It, it would be a change in the way you manage the burden of the treatment such that you're minimizing the disruption in the medicine. And I want to talk for a minute about patient goal setting. Now you might think patient goal setting, that's, we, we all do that or that's not all that important. But I really want to pause and have you understand how critical patient goal setting is to moving from what's the matter to what matters to you. Recently, a New England Journal of Medicine uh, devoted uh, a big section in, in the issue on patient goal setting. And more and more, we're seeing the results the, of research that show that when patients are involved in goal setting, that the clinical outcomes are better and the cost is lower. It's a really simple clinical intervention that we can do to move toward the triple aim. I'm borrowing a, a term from social science. In social science, they call ABCD, asset-based community development. But for us here in this room, I think ABCD can mean asset-based care design. It means that you really understand what the assets are for this patient and family, and that those get integrated into the patient goals. I promise you, if you start to employ uh, patient goal setting in your practices, on your units, if a patient's in the hospital, you'll start to see improvements in care and cost very quickly. So patient goal setting means that you sit and you understand not what's the matter today, but you understand the holistic uh, approach. You understand all that this patient brings and needs in their life, in their family, and then you use those assets to build the goals. And the results are beginning to come in. We're starting to see patients with diabetes being able to control their disease in a new way. Patients with heart, uh, with heart disease being able to even decrease medication and the like. 
But I want to tell you a story that just happened last week. I was um, last week uh, visiting two patients in the same day in two academic medical centers in Boston. The first in the morning, I was with a young girl in a pediatric hospital. And when I walked in, I had the most wonderful experience of patient goal setting. I was with her parents, and I sat with them when the multidisciplinary rounds team came in. It was her doctors, her nurses, her therapists, and her family. And the conversation went like this. It went, what should we be thinking about in terms of mobility today? And we think we'll get this young girl to walk to the next room this morning, and we'll see if she can make it to the playroom. And then this afternoon, if she does well, we'll move her father down the hall. Let's talk about her diet. What is she doing well with? Let's see if we can accelerate her diet. Pain management. We'll see if we can move from this pain medication to that one. They talked about all aspects of her testing. They said, today we've got three tests we've got to do. This is the sequence in which we'll do these tests in order that we can work on mobility and make sure that she gets something to eat. And then they even started thinking a little bit farther down the road toward her discharge. And they were coaching her parents to think, when she goes home, these are the things that you're going to need to start to prepare in your home so that she can go home in a smooth way. And I thought, this is multidisciplinary rounds and patient goal setting at its finest. The family was calm. The team was on the same page. And I felt so wonderful about the fact that we're starting to see progress in this way. I then went across town and visited a relative in an adult academic medical center in Boston, and I saw just the opposite happen. I saw this man in pain, uh, under a great deal of stress, and I said to him, what's the matter? And he said, I can't tell you, I don't know what's going on with me. And I looked to try and find the whiteboard with his team. He didn't know the names of his providers. But I watched as a young medical student came in and told him, you're on a clear liquid diet now. And he was so thirsty, he hadn't eaten or had anything to drink in, in almost a week. And then a nurse brought the tray in, and then the resident came in and said, you're NPO, and took the tray off the table. I watched one resident come in and say, you should take as much pain medication as you can because it's important for you to be comfortable and get up and walk. And the next resident came in and said, if you take a lot of pain medication, you're going to be constipated and you're going to be in real trouble by this afternoon. I watched one doctor come in and say, uh, you're going to be in the hospital for another week at least. And I watched the very next one come in and say, you're ready to go home today. This poor patient had no sense. He was torn between staff members. He was torn between no sense of a team or a plan. And I watched those two situations really focus for me in the very same day, in the very same city, how critical it is for us to move to daily goal setting. And then I came here to Paris, and I was meeting up with some colleagues from Scotland, and they were showing me the latest results from multidisciplinary rounds and daily goals. And they've been working on this as a whole country for a few years now with our IHI faculty and the fantastic leaders from Scotland. And you can see dramatic improvements in assuring that we get the same kind of care that that young girl got at the hospital in Boston. And what was most amazing to me was the next graph. And they said they're seeing reductions in ICU mortality across all of the hospitals, all of the ICUs in Scotland. And I said, oh, well, that must be related to ventilator bundles or um, central line infection decreases. And they said, yes, in part, but they actually believe that the multidisciplinary rounds and the daily goals are what provides them with the ability to be reliable in their care which they attribute to, be, to the reductions in mortality. So this is not only important for patient sanity and family strength, it's important for clinical outcomes, and it's important for cost. So think about this. How do we move to these kinds of improvements? It means that we really re need to redesign care at every level, whether you are in an ICU, using daily goals at, on a whiteboard at the end of the bed, or whether you are in a clinical encounter with a patient who's got diabetes and is going to be needing to create a care system for the year. 
Recently, I was in La Crosse, Wisconsin, in the middle of the United States, and I sat with some nurses and, and some care managers, and I said, tell me about how you're changing the way that you care for patients on the outpatient setting. I said, introduce me to a patient who you're taking care of now. And they introduced me to a patient whose name is Ethel. She's 95 years old, and last summer, Ethel's husband died. Ethel has no other family. And so she was isolated in her home. And she began to be depressed and lose weight. And pretty soon, Ethel was completely dependent on home care. Every morning, a nursing assistant would come in to her home, bathe her, feed her, get her in a wheelchair, and put her in front of a television. And you could just see her slowly deteriorating over the weeks. So the nurse, the care manager, said to Ethel, not what's the matter, but what matters to you? And Ethel said, I want a dog. And so the nurse said, no, no, I'm from healthcare. You know, I I'm the nurse. And Ethel kept saying, I want a dog. And this conversation went on for a few weeks, and the nurse kept reminding Ethel that she was the nurse, she came from health healthcare. Finally, one day on the way to Ethel's house, the nurse stopped at the pound and she picked up a little puppy and she brought it to Ethel. Within a month's time, Ethel is up and independent. She walks 150 steps by herself. She takes care of herself now. And three days a week, Ethel goes to the hospital, to the lobby, and she sits and plays the violin for other patients who are coming to the hospital. This is Ethel, and that's her violin, and that's her dog. <laughs> that's what we need to do. We need to move from what's the matter, and I can take care of you in this interaction, in this silo, to what matters to you, and how less, much less expensive is it to take a dog to Ethel than to provide 24-hour care for her in her home. What's Ethel's life like now when she's providing for others, when she's contributing to the, to the society as opposed to sitting in her wheelchair watching television? So at the patient level, I want to challenge you to move from what's the matter to what matters to you. The very next patient you see, whether it's in an ICU or in an office practice, I'm asking you to stop yourself and say, what matters to you? Break the ice and start to think about what assets does this patient and family have and how can I begin to build on those assets because we'll never solve the problems our own. Use daily goals and multi-professional rounds if the patient is in an inpatient setting and use year-long goals if the patient's got a chronic disease. Take the first step though and just ask the very next patient you see what matters to you. And now I'll move to the organization level. So, if we are to begin to think about changing care at the patient level, we're going to need to think about new ways to work. We're going to need to think about building our organizations in a different way. I'll give you two examples of changes at the organization level. The first is from Anchorage, Alaska. The South Central Foundation is a, a native healthcare system. Some years ago, the Native Americans, the Indians, took over their health care system from the professionals that had been imported into Alaska to provide care for the Native Americans. And when the Native Americans took over their own health care system, they said, what should we do? Should we send doctors down to, to the uh, lower part of the United States to get training and have them come back up and do care the same way? Or should we build our own health care system? They actually asked, should we build our own health system? And they came together and built what they call NUCA. NUCA is the Alaska word, Alaskan word that means strong buildings, and they also use that word to mean strong people. So they named their health system NUCA, and they named it that because on the one hand, they want to have strong and vibrant buildings, but on the other hand, they want to have it built on strong and vibrant relationships. So I'll show you the operating principles. And, and here, I want to ask you to go back and think, what are the operating principles in your head for your practice or for your hospital? And most of the time when I ask that question, people will say, well, it's about 
um, the head counts. It's about the, the number of visits a physician has to process in a day or the number of patients that a nurse can take care of in an ICU. The operating principles are structural. At NUCA, the operating principles are relational. And I put these up here so that you, you'll notice that the first letter of each one of these uh, words spells out relationships. So you can take that back and remember. But the very first operating principle says relationships between the customer owner, those are the Indians, the Native Americans, and the family comes next and the provider comes third. And they're saying that those relationships between the patient, the family, and the provider need to be built and nourished. Just look down through some of these. They says locations need to be convenient for the family. We need to be able to bring the family in, much as you're doing in New Zealand with uh, Ko Awatea and um, the Fauna Aura program. You're saying this is about the family, and we're going to have the operating principle be we build our system on those healing relationships. You can see here the hub is the family, and they focused a lot on the relationship between the, the providers. Multiprofessionalism is critical. And care teams are the core of the way that they provide work. If you walk through a NUCA uh, facility, there aren't doctor's offices at one end of the hall and nurses on the other. There are uh, places where people come together and that the team is very much built so that there's communication across all members of the multi-professional team so that people can work together on behalf of the family. So I share this with you to say, when you can stop and think about the assets in your organization, those are the employees. Every one of us came into healthcare with expertise and experience, with passion and compassion. And in many cases where I'm visiting today, those values, those assets have been beat out by financial pressures, by uh, demoralized uh, management systems. We're over-managing our assets in many cases. Those assets still exist. The doctors, the nurses, the therapists, the cleaners in our hospitals come to work every day with assets we need to uncover. And we need to use those. We need to see those skills and use them. And that's what NUCA's doing. So what happened? Over this last decade, they've seen dramatic reductions in the use of emergency departments, even in hospital admissions because as they've shifted from a disease system where you come in and they say, what's the matter, and we take care of your heart attack, to a health system, they're seeing care shift from the expensive parts of the system to a health system. So what they're seeing now is improvements in all aspects of the triple aim. Up at NUCA, you can see the health of the population improving. The care experiences are dramatically different and wonderful. And you can see the cost per capita expenditures are increasing at a rate much lower than the rest of the United States. So when you think about the assets in your organization and you redesign care that way, we can actually accomplish the triple aim at a lower cost. And I'll give you another example. Um, and that is, um, I was reading recently, I had to smile, I was reading some research uh, from North Shore Long Island Jewish uh, Medical Center in New York. It's the largest healthcare system in New York. And I was reading some research from a physician named Stephen Fishbane. He's a nephrologist, and he was presenting at the American Society of Nephrology. And he was presenting his research from New York, but on behalf of the United States, and he was looking at the effectiveness of dialysis treatment. He was actually comparing uh, longevity, life expectancy, and uh, capacity to live a vibrant and healthy life for patients on dialysis in the United States to patients here in Europe and Asia. And he was talking about the fact that in the United States, we have 300,000 people today who are on dialysis. In one uh, decade, 10 years from now, we expect it will be 500,000 because of the burdens of obesity and diabetes on the population. So it's a, a big number and getting bigger much faster. And what Dr. Fishbane was noticing is that the life expectancy for patients in the U.S. is shorter than here 
in, uh, in Europe and in Asia. And he was relating that in his research to the length of time a patient stays on dialysis per treatment. And he was talking about the viscosity of blood and the effect of the viscosity of blood on the patient's ability to recover from the dialysis treatment and then to go on to live a healthy life today and their life expectancy tomorrow. And I had to smile when I read the research because last year, right after this forum in the Netherlands, I was in Jönköping, Sweden, and I was walking through a hospital and I found the person, the patient, who was teaching Dr. Fishbane about the effectiveness of dialysis in New York. I was walking through a hospital in Jönköping, Sweden, Rehov Hospital, and the, the folks that were taking me showed me this is the unit where we help patients who are on dialysis. But then we walked into another building. And in this separate building, they said, these are all the patients who do their own hemodialysis. Now, I had never, in all my years in healthcare, been in a building where every patient took care of themselves. And so I said, how did this happen? And they said, well, we're very innovative. We've got Joran and Mats and Agneta, and we, you know, we, we've got these leaders. But I kept pushing and saying, really, how did you come to build a building where all the patients take care of themselves? And they introduced me to Christian. Christian, in 2005, was a young mechanic at Saab Avionics. And he was a triathlete and had a huge life planned out for himself when he came down with glomerulonephritis and ended up on dialysis. After a few weeks, he's a mechanic, remember, he said to his nurse, I want to do my own dialysis. And so she said, okay. And she taught him how to do his own dialysis. And then pretty soon, Christian was teaching the 73-year-old lady in the next bed who was saying, what are you doing? And he said, I'm doing my own dialysis. So she said, well, I want to learn how to do that. So pretty soon, every patient in this unit started doing their own dialysis. At Rehov, they now have an aim that 75% of their patients in this entire academic medical center should be able to do and be on their own self-dialysis. And right now, they're up to 60%. So I talked with Christian, and I said, Christian, how did you get the courage to say, I want to do my own dialysis. And he said, I did a lot of research into the life expectancy of people with dialysis. And I realized that in order for me to live a long and healthy life, in order for me to even be able to have a, a long and healthy afternoon this afternoon, I needed to control my own dialysis. And he said, I began to test it out, and I realized that if I stayed on dialysis longer, then I did not suffer from post-dialysis syndrome. He said, before, I would have dialysis in the morning, and I would have to go directly to home, crawl into bed, and stay there for the whole afternoon. He said, basically, my life was the one treatment, and that was it. But he said, I realized when I calibrated the length of my own dialysis, then at the end of the treatment, I felt great. I could get up and live a, a healthy afternoon. I had my life back. As I spent the day with him, at the end of the day, I asked him this bottom question. I said, but Christian, what about safety? Now, I was an ICU nurse and then a hospital CEO. So I said, Christian, what about safety? And he said, well, of course the care is safer in my hands. And that's not what I expected. I expected him to say, well, I can always call a nurse if I need help. But he said, first of all, he said, this is my own um, bacteria. He said, you are all introducing different bacteria when you introduce uh, my treatment. And he said, secondly, I do it the same way every day. He said, every day, you each have your own methods, your own supplies, your own sequences, and the variation is extraordinary. So he said, of course the care is safer in my hands. And then I talked with Annette, the nurse leader, and I asked her, why did you, what, 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 what's happening to you now that you are the nurse leader? And she said, well, she said, as the patients have taken over, I've realized that they have a tremendous voice in the way that we design the unit. When they were designing this new building, she said, Christian knocked on the door one day and said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm designing the new unit. And he said, do you mind if I have a peek, you know? And so uh, she was describing how she was designing this home-like setting with warm lighting and, you know, artwork on the walls. And he said, 
that's not what I want. He said, it's a hospital, goddammit. I just want it to look like a hospital. But he said, there is an investment I want you to make, and I'll show you what that is in a minute. But I said, Annette, what do you do now if you're not taking care of patients? And she said, I looked out one day, and I said, none of these patients are working, but they're all vibrant now that they're controlling their own dialysis. So she said, now, imagine this, the head nurse of the dialysis unit. She says, when a patient gets admitted to my unit, the first thing I do is I sit with them, and I help them write their CV. That's the first thing the head nurse does. And then once a month, she brings in the county unemployment bureau. And if somebody wants to go back to work, she helps them to do that. So I said to Christian, did you go back to Saab? Did you go back to your job as a mechanic? And he said, no. And I was thinking, oh, a failure. And he said, no, I'm an RN. He said, I went back to nursing school because I was here anyway. So now <laughs> he, he works on the ENT unit the ear, nose, and throat unit at the Rehov at the Academic Medical Center. That's a success story. That's what's the ma what matters to you. And so this is what Christian said to invest in. He said, invest in exercise equipment, because he said, now we want to exercise while we're dialyzing. And I ask you to go back and visit your dialysis unit, because I've been in dialysis units now from Alaska to New Zealand, and I have not found another one that looks like this. I have not found one where people are exercising while they're on dialysis, where many people are working when they're done with their treatment. And the costs are much lower than the average dialysis. Complications are dramatically reduced, and Annette measures her success by what matters to the patients. I smiled again, though, because just last week, I heard from one of our former fellows, a physician, Tricia Woodhead, from England, and she told me that she had been talking about this in England, and some folks had heard about Christian from me. So Joe Bibby at the Health Foundation sponsored a trip from some physicians from Yorkshire in England. And these physicians are nephrologists and nurses who work in the renal unit, and they heard about this, and they couldn't really quite imagine that their patients were the same as Christian. Everybody thinks our patients are sicker, and that's why I could never do this. So the Health Foundation sponsored a visit up to Yunchipping, and this is the folks from Yorkshire on their way up to visit the uh, dialysis center in, in Riov. They came back with a plan, and they said, in three years, our model of care will have moved us from we take care of patients to all patients are either on dialysis at home, or they're assisted in their own self-dialysis. They've already got funding, they've already started building, and I predict next year the Yorkshire people will be here presenting some dramatic results that look just as good as Christian's. So at the organizational level, look out at the assets that we've overlooked and overmanaged. What is the passion and the expertise that we've underutilized in our places? Figure out how to redesign care with patients and then buy a plane ticket and send some folks off to find the very best practices in the world, and it will inspire them to come back and produce results that are so much closer to the triple aim than anything most of us have today. And then finally, I want to talk about the community. When I go back to South Carolina next week, my visit is going to be very different than it's been in the past years. It's going to be a very different place because we're looking at the community assets and bringing those together with the healthcare system. At Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they define health this way. Health starts where we live, learn, and play. Health starts where we live, learn, and play. Those are the assets we don't see when we're in one of the silos. We really, really need to get out and figure out where does health start, because that's the job we end up with. And at WHO, they define the social determinants of health this way. The conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And then they put dot, 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 including the healthcare system. So I bring to you a graph that I often use when I'm looking at the determinants of health. And when I use this graph with people, I'll say these are the determinants of health. If we're going to be focused on improving the health of our populations, these are the determinants that we have to play with. Can you find us? We're right there. That's healthcare. 
That's the impact that we have on health. So we can't do it alone. We've got to really think in a totally different way about the assets that we bring to health. We've just done a project in Malawi with the Health Foundation over these last four years, and it drove home powerfully to me how we need to step outside the healthcare frame. The folks from Malawi are here. I encourage you to track them down and talk to them about the progress that they've made. We set some goals with the Health Foundation four years ago to decrease maternal mortality and to decrease neonatal mortality in a country where these burdens are exceptionally high. And if we started working in the normal way, working in hospitals, working in clinics. And what we found is that we weren't making the kind of progress that we needed to. So we went back and said, what are the real issues? And we created what we called the three delays model. We began to realize that a big chunk of the mortality was related to delays in deciding to seek care. Either uh, the woman would wake up and say, it's just a little bleeding, or I don't feel quite so bad. And the delays in seeking care were pervasive in many of the communities, in many of the tribes. Then there were delays in reaching the facility. Well, you can actually watch the mortality ra raise every uh, rainy season when the roads turn to mud and the patients can't travel by bike or by uh, motorcycle to the hospitals. And then there are delays when a patient gets to the hospital. So we created two interventions. One is PDSA's plan do study acts in the facilities, and the other is working with women's groups and task forces in the community. We began to focus on increasing demand, keeping handwritten signs in each one of the tribal areas. How many people live in this tribe? How many women are there of childbearing age? How many women are pregnant? How many children are there? So that everybody starts to get a sense of the demand. And then working on referral and access and working in the hospitals to create better care. The results are amazing. After four years, we're now seeing a 22% reduction in neonatal mortality rates, but only when we combine the facility interventions with the community interventions. Neither one of those interventions alone produced any improvement. And this proved to me dramatically that in our little silos of healthcare, we're never going to make the progress we need until we step out and see the assets in our communities. So back to Columbia, South Carolina. I'll be back there next week, and we still have obesity. We still have uh, chronic disease management to work on. But I've been very taken with Tom Frieden, who's the director of the Center for Disease Control Health Impact Pyramid. What Dr. Frieden is saying is that our healthcare system, counseling, education, and clinical interventions, those little um, the little pieces at the peak of the health impact pyramid are the way that we traditionally interact with patients. But the impact on health is small. And so what I'm asking you to do is move down the pyramid and start to think about context. We've got to start to move to the asset base in the community and thinking about context if we're going to have a broader intervention. An example is a recent um, experiment in the United States where women in a very uh, poverty-stricken area were given, food uh, were given housing vouchers to move to a neighborhood that was a little bit less poor. And the results were, were impressive to me, that when you gave a woman, uh, especially a woman with a, a family, a voucher to move to a different house, what you saw was a decrease in morbid obesity, a decrease in diabetes, and a decrease in all the complications associated with those diseases. The housing voucher is a lot cheaper than adding on many more silos to our broken healthcare system. It's a, a context change that's producing much different clinical outcomes. And then there's the context of food. And so whenever, I'll tell you a secret if I ever come to visit you, whenever I go to a healthcare organization, the first thing I'll say when I come in in the morning is let's go get a cup of coffee because I want to go into the cafeteria and see what the context is like. And the context is often not like what I saw in Wisconsin when I visited recently. When you think about it, healthcare providers are among the most stressed workers in the world. 
We have physical stresses in our everyday lives. We have emotional stresses. We've got people's lives in our hand. We've got cross-professional stresses. We learn different languages. We've got uh, time stresses, and we've got fatigue stresses. And when you watch a healthcare person taking care of themselves or not taking care of themselves in the course of their daily work, you as healthcare leaders can change the context because if someone is extremely stressed and they walk into the cafeteria and they see big mounds of pasta and big mounds of, uh, of um, fattening food, fried chicken, then that's what they'll eat for comfort. But if you change the context, what you see is people starting to take care of themselves. That's our obligation. Michelle Obama, just a few weeks ago, was addressing a group and she said, when you're in this room and you're talking about health, everybody in this room is talking about health, then we walk down the hall to the cafeteria and you're serving death. And it's a very profound statement, but many hospitals that I've been in serve death in their cafeteria. It's an example, though, of how we need to understand the context to really look beyond the walls of a medication or a blood pressure machine and say, we need to change the way that we create context of health in our communities in order to get to the triple aim. So in the communities, I would ask you to think about your patient segments. How many are frail and elderly? How many of them are young and, and healthy? What I find in many organizations today is that they're focused on the hotspotters, the top 3% that take up about 70 or 75% of healthcare costs. I'm asking you, in addition, to focus on the bottom 50%. Because the bottom 50%, those are the healthy people today, only account for 3% of the costs. And so in most healthcare systems, they're ignored. Nobody's calling them on their cell phone. They, they're not taking up any space right now. But they will if we, just do, if we leave them alone now. So understand those segments and figure out what would be the best context setting? And how do I understand the assets in the community? How do I begin to move from disease care to health care? How do I begin to move to asset-based care designs to think about patients and staff and communities in a different way? How do I begin to think about the edge of change and moving, as South Carolina is now, from little boxes of silos to breaking through and collaborating together so that together we can answer these questions. What matters to you? What are the assets that exist in my community? And how together can we work to get to the IHI triple aim? And I just want to leave you with one, one final question, one final challenge, and that is to take care of yourselves. Because if you don't, your families aren't going to be healthy, your patients aren't going to be healthy, and we'll never get to the triple aim. If we could create a better sense of health and balance among the 2,800 people who are here today, we could be setting a very powerful example. So I'm asking you to go out, take the first step out of the silo, learn from each other here this week, have great fun, and take care. Thank you.